This is a painting made by a member of the, by a descendant of the Anusim from Chicago who didn't even know that being a Sephardita means that you are a member of the Anusim. It's a painting of Luis de Carvajal el Mozo burning at a stake. Uh, the Anusim are present everywhere, Spain and Portugal or the colonies, wherever the colonies were held. This includes all of Latin America, Goa, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, parts of Africa, and many islands in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Additionally, Anusim can be found in areas they escaped to, such as France, uh, Italy, Holland, and the like, not to mention the Provence, which was open to the Jews at the time of the expulsion. Furthermore, Communities can also be found in large U.S. cities, such as New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and several cities uh, such as Texas and other cities in the U.S. Uh, then there are Boston, which houses a large Portuguese community, and Canada, where there seem to be large communities as well. So much for demography from my personal experience. My next goal is to try and address the complex issue of researching this mysterious culture, which in the first place is secret, and in the second is coming apart even as we speak. Secrecy remains an issue for two reasons. The first is embedded in the tradition and is inseparable from it. The second is fear. On account of this secrecy, many scholars presumed that once the Inquisition was over, so did the secret Jews disappear. Although this is contrary to logic, this was pretty much unanimously accepted. But a combination of anti-Semitism and a few Jews changed all that. Samuel Schwartz discovered the Belmonte Jewish community because of a warning of an anti-Semitic merchant. Seymour Liebman in Mexico, on the other hand, asked Don Israel Cavazos, a member of the Anusim himself, as it turned out eventually, if there were any Anusim left and was answered in the negative. Cavazos was protecting his community. Liebman, taking him at face value, wrote in his book, The Jews of New Spain, that with the disappearance of the Inquisition, so did the Anusim. I give him credit for asking. Little did he know about the trouble schol scholars would be facing in northern Mexico, getting into archives and discovering the truth. I was the first to extract the truth from Cavazos. I left him no choice. <laughs> How does a scholar approach a secret cul culture? Where does he or she arm themselves with prior knowledge with which to begin the research. In the case of the Anusim, the main source was always the Inquisition. But be it the bulls posted on the do church doors or processes, which were a poor representation of reality. I have demonstrated elsewhere that Hernando Alonso, one of the first victims of me the Mexican Inquisition, was an old Christian, falsely accused. Likewise, I have shown that countless Judaizers, as they were called, died at the hand of the Inquisition for observing an ancient Catholic rite practiced throughout the world, throughout the centuries, including in Spain today. The Inquisition had so many unjust reasons for their actions that and such a minute portion of the processes has been studied, they are a poor, if indi indispensable source. Thus, in coming to study this secret and surprising group, one must also have deep knowledge of medieval Jewish practices, separately, especially ones that have ceased to be practiced in modern Jewish communities. It is also very helpful to approach representing a Jewish side, not a Catholic one. In my case, I am a Sephardi, female and learned person, it was a good mix. The Anusim have early on become a matricentric culture. So it was a matricentric culture, 
So there were these nice elderly women, and they were the center. It was a matricentric culture. And even the responsa literature gives them credit for being the center of the community. They were the leaders. They were the ones who, who organized everything. Studying a secret culture requires building trust much more so than in the case with normal research involving people. It also demands that the scholar come armed with knowledge that can build bonds. In my case, knowledge of Jewish practices of medieval Spain, having studied relevant rabbinic culture, helped me guess at practices reserved by Anusim, like cutting nails and burning them, burning hair ends, despite the fact that most of, of nor all normative Jews have abandoned many of them. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of knowledge. Indeed, an author published a book about the Anusim saying pitifully that they prayed five times on the Day of Atonement, he may be here, forgive me, never realizing that it is and always has been the norm. Although, it was for, although I was fortunate enough to have been well received by the entire community of Anusim, the research fields as I studied, I never neglected to interview related groups, be they priests, individuals that clearly didn't belong to the group, funeral home managers, rabbis, anyone that might shed light on my studies. So you saw Rabbi Kaiman, and you saw the Archbishop. My effort rewarded me with a great breadth and depth. After several long stays during which fast <coughs> friendships were built to the point that nobles from northern Mexico were present at our son's wedding in Jerusalem, I had a picture of the region that included the observances of all, and I repeat, all Jewish dietary laws, many holy days, Details about the history of the earlier failed attempts, again of the earlier people, failed attempts of local Anusim to return to Judaism because Rabbi Kaiman preferred his relationship with the Archbishop, and countless more important facts. So let's, let's go into methodology and how and why it changes as we have moved into the 21st century. From the very start, transmission has been inconsistent. In some families, all children were informed of the Jewish ident identity in clear and orderly fashion. In others, one child, almost invariably a female, received all the transmission while the rest were not informed at all. There, then there was a deathbed confession. Those present heard, but often it was difficult to find context. The oblique message would give children strange comments without context. Like somebody would live where there's no Jews at all, and the father would tell her, your legs are so fat, anybody could tell you are a Jew. Just to mention that she's Jewish in some way. Today, you're a bad little Jew. Today, you're a good little Jew in a place where the child never ever saw a Jew and no explanation is given. And finally, many offspring never hear anything at all. Were I to begin my research today, I would not be able to report all this to you. Already as I've begun my study, I was realizing that my informants were losing the resources. On the one hand, grandparents were passing away, and on the other, the young set often no longer shared a language in common with the ancianos. The vertical lines of transmission were breaking down. It is for this reason that I was the first to open a website to serve Anusim, and the first to encourage a member of the Anusim to open a listserv for Anusim moderated internally. In the absence of vertical transmission, the need presented itself for a horizontal alternative. By now, many websites and listservs are out there, including the Natania one, as well as some excellent genealogical services such as Jewish Gen, which is moderated academically. 
And I had opportunities to stay at homes of informants, noble families and humble ones. Thus, I was able to observe, not just hear about practices preserved in this home. The hidden nature of the phenomenon under investigation in this work requires an uncommon, unstructured style of interview. In this secret culture, so much has been lost and so much remains hidden. Though the younger generation may seek me out, the older generation is loath to speak to strangers. In many places, including most of Mexico, only selected youngsters, if any, are handed down any oral history pointing to a Jewish identity. Often, the very young ones who were actually told of Jewish origins had no idea that the home practices I would ask about had anything to do with the Jewish fact. Mixing meat and milk is just very bad for your stomach, didn't you know? In Nuevo León, transmission of family origins is often more explicit. Some Mexicans, especially from elitist family, were told that they were different from others only because the family touted itself as old Christian nobility or because or descendants of the old, from old world conquistadors. But such family often turned out to be of new Christian stock. So I looked in particular for traces of family customs that can be reasonably explained as of Jewish origin. If such customs combined with a sense of separate cultural identity, then that could betray a claim of Sephardic descent. I concentrated on home practices since they would be much more likely to have survived the many years of Mexican Inquisition. I looked especially for practices that are traceable either to rabbinic law or Sephardic custom and which are not shared by normative Catholics. To this end, biblical practices are of less significance on their own since they could perhaps be attributed to fundamentalist Christian sects that were active in the area. Practices that appear as evidence of Judaizing on, uh, on edicts of faith and inquisition dossiers, especially those from Mexico, were deemed of particular importance. I needed to attempt to elicit information about things that the individuals themselves might not identify as anything unusual at all and take them one step at a time. I had to learn to ask not to ask, do you, but rather, did your grandparents? And who else does the same? It is important to remember that we are dealing with a secret culture, which until today remains very private. With virtually no exception, I did not tell anybody with whom else I was in contact, even if they were members of the same family. Thus, sometimes, one member of a family of a particularly noble family would tell me that they were Sephardites, showing me photos of the family patriarch, telling me of their Jewish customs, and how the non-Sephardita spouse would be making jokes about the family's aversion to pork. At the same time, another sibling, knowing nothing about the previous encounter, would tell me that the origins of their family are Basque, and would quote as authority the famed Don Israel Cavazos. All my informants were guaranteed that nothing that passed between us would ever be divulged in any way that could help identify its source, and I kept it. My thesis is in English on the internet. Any name that is there is by persons who wanted their name there. Usually the interviews did not include, did not, the interviewees did not volunteer anything about family origins. I would need to ask what their or their ancestors' surnames name were. If they knew anything about when they arrived, where... Uh, okay, we can skip all that. They would seem to know something about... If they would seem to know something about food, I would ask more about that. Then I would ask about standard daily meals. Did they have the sayuno, the light breakfast, almuerzo, the heavy ones, what exactly was eaten, what was imbibed, and so on. And I always asked if they had milk with a coffee afterwards, because the ones who observed uh, separation of meat and milk had the coffee black. Um, I asked questions about birth-related customs, 
there were differences in how the quarantena, as in quarantine, 40 days after the birth, were kept. I inquired about marriage, death and burial, which are among the least, the last custom to be forgotten in any culture, have been taken over by the funerarias, the funeral homes. So I went to the funerarias and I asked them about the olden days, what were the special requests and so on, and I found some mortajas, the burial shrouds. And there were two kinds, we don't have time. I also asked medical doctors what, morta what the use of the word mortaja is now. When invited to someone's home, I would look for Santos crucif crucifixes and so on, and I asked about what they meant. I would ask about weekends, when did they clean, how did they observe, what was observed, Friday, Sunday, etc. I always looked for sayings, teachers. For example, todo lo que corre y vuela a la cazuela. Anything that can run or fly in the pan it goes represents one culture. On the opposite, eres tan mala como la carne del puerco, you are so bad like pork meat, represents the other culture. Jewish Belmonte is disappearing. The elderly are almost gone and the young ones are moving to Israel. Most of the practices are also wa are vanishing. So how do we find what is left? We have to rely heavily on memories. We have to rely on neighbors who consider their, ne their neighbors to be Jewish. Uh, okay, and we have to look for new fields of research. <coughs> if we find a village where somebody, we, where we know that it is a closed village of Anusim, we have to be very careful. I can't go into it, come and ask me. Brazil is still teeming with Anusim seeking to return. Go help them. The Sertal and the Bahia are full still with information. The rest of the country is still ready to be discovered. Many customs were preserved there and elsewhere. And then there are many new fields untouched. I was in Sri Lanka. There were masks there of, of, of all kinds of demons and stuff. And then there were masks with human face. King and queen, but the human faces were completely um, grotesque. These were faces of Portuguese. Go look what's there. Um, uh, many Anusim tried and failed to return in Holland, and they returned to secret Jewish life. I am sure you can do stuff there. In the Bayonne synagogue, a rabbi came back to me and told me that people came to him and said that they had customs, but they had no proof, and he ignored them. When I went to Bayonne, people said, no, no, there's no Anusim there. Of course there are Anusim there. And so are many other places, Goa, probably. And so it's time to go looking in many, many other places. I wish, uh, I, wish I could be more clear. I wish I could show you the PowerPoint. Um, I wish you all a good year. <laughs> this is a picture of a group of Anusim that the chief rabbi Bakshi Doron came out of vacation to meet. So there is a sympathy and empathy for the Anusim, but it's a long road to help them make it easily home. He wanted to build everything for them, but he failed. Thank you.